So, let's just ask the Lord's blessing once more as we open his word for this final lecture this morning. Father, we give you thanks again for the time that we've been able to be around the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for being able to celebrate his life and his death and his resurrection. We thank you for the fact that we serve a risen Savior, and we thank you that he's there at your right hand. And we would ask that as you have brought us into relationship with yourself, you've also brought us into relationship with one another in the body of Christ. And we realize that there are difficulties that come along in life's way, and we would just ask that you would help us to be able to resolve these difficulties as they come in a biblical way, and we would just commit our time as we've been looking at this subject uh, for conflict resolution from a biblical point of view, and we cry out to you for help. We re recognize the fact that your word, no matter what the difficulty is, your word has the answer, and we thank you that there is uh, your word in our hands, there is the Holy Spirit in our lives. We thank you for the word of God. Uh, we thank you for the presence of the spirit of God. We thank you for the presence of a man in the glory at your right hand. And we thank you too for one another. And we just ask now for your blessing as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Yesterday, if you weren't able to be with us, um, we were taking up the, the thought of biblical conflict or conflict from a resolving conflict from a biblical point of view. And um, there are booklets in the back. Um, maybe we can, if you don't have one, just raise your hand. And those are for yours to keep, to take home. There's also this little brochure from the Peacemaking uh, Ministries that much of the material that we have um, are using in that booklet that I've compiled is a lot of it comes out of this. I also recommended two books yesterday, one called The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy and the other one called The Peacemaker Student Edition for Teenagers. So um, much of the material that we um, are presenting this weekend comes right from, from this. Uh, we looked at this little chart yesterday. Uh, we looked at the fact that there are uh, three different ways to respond to conflict when conflict comes. The, the first way that we looked at is the escape responses. We called that uh, peace faking. Uh, the, the idea there was that there are some that, that uh, try to deny it, sweep it under the carpet, that we've even got a problem. They ignore it, hope it goes away. There are some that run from the problem. And then the ultimate there, uh, as you go down on that chart, the ultimate is some would commit suicide. On the opposite end of this, we have the idea of uh, assaulting one another. This is this side, while this is peace faking, this is peace breaking. These are people that really don't care about uh, whether there's peace or not. They want their way. And they will assault, whether physically or verbally or whatever it might be, uh, even materially. Uh, they'll take someone to court, litigate, and it, the ultimate on that side is murder. We looked at the biblical response, and this is kind of where we want to continue. Um, there are certain ones that overlook. There are certain problems that we can overlook. We can overlook problems if it has to do with me. If I can overlook it, then it's best, it's the glory of a man to overlook the faults of others. Uh, so the, to, uh, the idea here is to overlook, to reconcile, to negotiate the problems through. Uh, we looked at the fact that these are personal these first two were personal. These, we might have to get assistance to help. These next three. And then we might even have to get more assistance and bring in the assembly. And there's accountability. We talked about all this yesterday. But just by way of review, we'll look at that. I wanted to just cover it again. The bi biblical view of conflict. I think we closed yesterday with this slide. Okay. Uh, we, we mentioned yesterday that conflict is a difference of opinion or a purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. The primary cause, causes of conflict, is misunderstanding. And I want to dwell uh, today a little bit on this, this morning. Uh, we pretty extensively looked at the attitude yesterday. 
And I want to think about this idea of misunderstanding this morning. I want to look at some scriptures in that regard to help us to be able not to have misunderstandings. Uh, differences in goals, values, gifts, callings, priorities, expectations, interests, opinions, a competition over limited resources, and then sinful attitudes and habits. So we just kind of want to pick up today with this. The conflict is not always bad. We mentioned this yesterday. And this is very important for us to realize that conflict is not always bad. Conflict, there's some differences are natural and beneficial. I was thinking this morning, I shared this with Elias, I was thinking this morning, uh, whenever I'm in an assembly that has uh, mixed cultures, I often think about the scriptures that will remind us that someday very soon, out of every tribe and every tongue and every nation, every knee is going to bow to the Lord Jesus and give him his rightful place of praise. And when when we think of that today, realizing the uh, different cultures that are represented right here in this room, we all do things a little bit differently. In my assembly, if you visited my assembly, you would see that things are done a little bit differently than, than what we did here this morning. And that's okay. Just because we're different doesn't make it wrong. A lot of times, this is at the root of a lot of problems. Because I have in my mind that things ought to be done this way. You have in your mind that things ought to be done that way. Well, of course, my way is better. So if you would just submit to my way, we'd get along just fine. But the Lord has put us, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Lord has put us, it says three times, that God has placed the members in the body just where he wants them. And that passage of scripture also says that there's not one member in the body of Christ that's not important. That every member, even the members that aren't seen, are very, very important to the body. I've never seen my heart, but I thank God it's there. I've never seen my kidneys, but I know what will happen if, I, if something happens to my kidneys. I've never seen my liver. I've, there's parts of my body I've never seen. There are unseen members in my body that function that are very important. And there are unseen members in the body in a local assembly that is extremely important. And by the way, I personally believe that I am not in Corona, Michigan because I chose to be in Corona, Michigan. You are not attending Bethesda Christian Assembly, is that what we call it? Uh, because you chose to. You're here because God has placed you here. And as God has placed you here in this local expression of the body of Christ, he has a purpose for you. For some, it might be a public, public uh, display, and others might be more private, more behind the scenes, but everyone is important. And if we all do the function that we are required to do, that God has chosen us to do, and we don't try to seek somebody else's responsibility, if I do what God has given me to do, and I'm faithful to what God has given me to do, we'll see that the body functions just right. But what if my, what if my kidney all of a sudden wanted to do the talking? Well, that sounds kind of crazy, kind of sounds silly, but sometimes that's the way we are when God has chosen us to do something. Uh, Wesley mentioned to me yesterday after one of the meetings that he was in a meeting one time and, and they were talking about uh, carpentry work and people that have never lifted a hammer were trying to tell everybody else how to do the carpentry work and you had like four or five different carpenters that were right there and they were quiet. They weren't saying anything. They were kind of smirking a little bit because these other guys were telling them how to do the work. But here you have professionals that know how to do carpentry work and people that have never done carpentry work. You get the point, right? We've all been given gifts. And if we would use those gifts to the glory of God and faithful in doing what God has given us to do in the local assembly, there'd be a lot less difficulties. And not look and want his job and his responsibility, but do what the Lord has given me to do. And the Lord will raise me up. The Lord will 
eventually bring me into a place where he wants me to be. And he will, he's desiring me to be faithful in the areas that he's given me presently. And he who is faithful in the small things, greater things will be given, Scripture says. So many differences are, are not right. They're not wrong. They are the result of God-given diversity. Unity is not uniformity. The unity that God has established, he's given us unity, but he's also given us diversity. And it's good for us to remember that unity is not conformity. We need to rejoice in the diversity of God's creation. We should view conflict then as an opportunity to demonstrate the love and power of God in our lives. So it's an opportunity. We'll pick up with this in just a minute, the idea of an opportunity. Again, it's an opportunity to gl glorify God. Uh, conflict always affords an opportunity to glorify God, to trust God instead of relying on myself. It's an opportunity to obey God. It's an opportunity to imitate God. It's an opportunity to acknowledge God. God in control. And so how good uh, conflict can be, not necessarily a negative thing. The scripture pattern is to love our enemies and to do good to those who misuse us. And even to love those that we may disagree with, I think is important here. We want to grow to be like Christ. God's highest purpose for us is not that we become rich and famous. God's highest purpose for us is not that we gain our way in the local assembly. God's purpose is that each one of us would be like his beloved son. The book of Romans chapter 8 reminds us that he is conforming us into the image of his son. He's molding and shaping us. And sometimes he does that. I have to tell you that there are times in my life where I have to confess that there's a lot of rough edges on this individual stone. And it takes the water of adversity to knock off the edges so that this stone can be more conformed to the living stone, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what he does is he puts us into the storms of life. He puts us sometimes in the deep waters so that the waters can can knock off and remove the rough edges. I think it's significant, and I'll just, I just use this uh, illustration from, from David. Isn't it significant that when David went down to face Goliath, he went down and stooped down and picked up those five smooth stones? And it's not by accident that Scripture said they were smooth stones. How did they get smooth? The pressure of the water that they came from, the brook in which they came from, no doubt caused those stones to be smooth. And God wants to use us. Those five stones were placed into the pouch of David. And David reached in and he grabbed one of those stones. And one of those stones were put into the sling. You are a stone. And the adversity, the conflicts that we face are just opportunities for God to rub off the edges so that because we have one life to live, will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. And so we have one opportunity. That stone that was placed in the pouch of David and that stone that was then placed into the sling of David and that, slow, that stone that David slung into the air was guided by God's hand, God's omnipotent hand, and it hit its mark. But that stone had to have all the rough edges knocked off. And I want to say that adversity is just that. Conflict that comes is just that. Whether it's conflict with another brother or conflict with a sister, conflict in a marriage, conflict in the family setting, wherever that conflict is, it's an opportunity for the rough edges, not of my wife, you know, the rough edges for her to get. What an opportunity for my wife, because we're having a, a, a conflict. What an opportunity for all her rough edges to get knocked off. 
No, that can't be my attitude. We looked at that yesterday. My attitude ought to be, what an opportunity for these rough edges to get knocked off of me so that I can be the husband that God wants me to be. So that I can be the man that God wants me to be. You see, so conflict is not always a negative thing. I'll worry less about going through the trials and focus more about growing through the trials. You see, it's your choice. You can say, woe is me that we're going through these trials. Woe is me that we're having these conflicts. Or Lord, how do you want to grow me through these conflicts? Conflicts are inevitable. We know that. We're going to have them in life. But it's our response to them. I was listening to a tape on the way in. Uh, I travel with brothers that have uh, passed away. I travel, whenever I leave home, I take, I have hundreds and hundreds of cassette tapes, and I still have a car that has a cassette player, okay? So, and I, I travel with brothers that have passed on, they being dead yet still speak, and one of the tapes, the brother was talking about the difference between our reactions and our responses. Do you know that reactions are almost always fleshly? Reactions, when I react, we call it a knee-jerk reaction. And when I react, it's almost always in the flesh. But when I respond, you know the Lord Jesus never reacted, but he always responded. He always responded in the spirit, never reacted as we do. And so the challenge for us is how are we going to respond? We need to worry less about going through the trials and focus more about growing through those trials. So we find that God's highest purpose for us is not that we become rich and famous, not that we worry about, uh, that we worry less about going through the trials and focus more on growing, growing through those trials. But then I want to just suggest this, thinking about adversity. The ABCs of spiritual growth. The ABCs of spiritual growth. Adversity builds character. Isn't that true? I mean, we, we use it in the sports analogy all the time. For those of us that have been in sports, we know that the, the difficulties and the, the, the losses build character. Uh, some teams have lots of losses, right? So they've got lots of character. But adversity builds character. You can't be a man of character or a woman of character without facing adversity in your life. It's an impossibility. And so we need to realize that it's all part of the growing process when conflicts do come. And so instead of looking at it in a negative way, we want to look at it in a positive way. I'd like you to turn with me now, if you would, just thinking of those slides, I'd like you to turn with me to uh, James chapter 1. There's a couple of verses in James that I'd like us to focus on in the remaining time that we have. Yesterday, we spent a lot of time in James chapter 4, and this, this morning, I'd like to go back to James chapter 1, and there's two verses there particularly that stand out about how to handle conflict. As we said, conflict is going to come, they're gonna, it's going to spring up. Sometimes it takes us by surprise. Sometimes we, we find ourselves in the middle of conflict, and we don't even know how we got there, but we're there. Sometimes it's, it's, it, we see it coming on the horizon, but other times it, it shows up and boy, we're surprised we're there. But this is an interesting thing. Those of you that know Latin, the word conflict, um, and I'm sure that we have just a bunch of Latin scholars here right now, but the, the word conflict comes from a Latin word, which actually means to strike two things together. So that's the meaning of the word, to strike two things together. For example... Uh, to strike a flint and an iron, and what do you get? Fire, right? You get fire. So the idea is to strike two things together. But here's something else. Maybe we don't have Latin scholars. Maybe we have a lot of people that can speak Chinese. Nobody? Okay. But the Chinese word for conflict is very interesting. The characters used in, China, in, in uh, Chinese for conflict is actually two characters. And both characters are very significant. The one word, the one character, the symbol, it means danger. 
And the other symbol means opportunity. So every conflict reminds us, that symbol reminds us, that every conflict that you face is a conflict for opportunity or danger. There's opportunity or danger. Now, you can, you can face conflict and you can think of conflict as being a danger. Or you can look at conflict and think of it as being an opportunity for God to get the glory. And you remember that's where we started out yesterday. The number one thing, the number one motivation in time of conflict is, am I going to glorify God in this situation? That's the number one concern that ought to be on every believer's heart. How can I glorify? Yes, we have this problem. I have this problem with my, with my husband. I have this problem with my wife. I have these problems with my children. I have this problem with my boss. I have this problem with the brother in the meeting. But how can I glorify God in this problem? It's an opportunity to glorify God. Or it's an opportunity for danger and for the devil to get his foot in the door, as we spoke yesterday. So in thinking about this, I want to look at these couple of verses and just try to give us some practical helps. Look at verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19. I, I feel that James gives us in those, these two verses, particularly verse 19, four steps of how to handle conflict. Four steps. And I just want to give them to us. Number one, he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let me just read the whole verse. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So the first thing, the first step, James 1, verse 19 and 20. The first step, my beloved brethren. This is the first step. What does James tell him? James says, listen. You are part of the same family. You're in the family of God together. He reminds them by using this term, my beloved brethren. Beloved, meaning that God sent his only begotten son to purchase you at a tremendous price, the price of his beloved son. And in redeeming you, he's brought you and placed you in the family of God. You are brothers and sisters. How can you allow this conflict to divide you? And it reminds us of what Abraham said. You remember in Genesis chapter 13? Remember what Abraham said? Lots of uh, people, lots of servants were striving with Abraham's servants. And, and Abraham being the older one, he could have said, listen, I'm older. I've been around longer. I know what I'm talking about. After all, God appeared to me, didn't appear to you. After all, I'm God's, I'm a friend of God, and God's going to use me. In fact, God has promised to, to make my descendants as plentiful as the, the stars and the, and the sand. So you listen to me, Lot. Abraham didn't do that. There was a problem. And Abraham said, Lot. Why should we strive together? We are brethren. That's what he said. We are brethren. Look it up. It's in Genesis chapter 13. He says, we're in the same family. We shouldn't be striving together. Lot, if you choose right, I'll go left. If you choose left, I'll go right. I don't really care. I want to keep the peace. We're in the family of God together. Abraham was willing to lay down. Remember those two goats we talked about yesterday? Abraham was willing to lay down and let Lot take what he wanted. Abraham did not say, it's got to be my way. Abraham was willing to give up. And say, this really doesn't matter. And a lot of our problems, there are some very significant conflicts that we get ourselves into. And the Lord allows for a purpose. 
and some of them have to be dealt with and resolved in some of the ways that we've talked about. But many of the difficulties that we find ourselves in, beloved, can be dealt with one-on-one. -on -one. And if we had the heart of Abraham, as I said yesterday, it takes two to fight. Abraham put the battle down right there before it ever got started. Abraham said, we're not going to have this conflict. We're brethren. We're in the family together. I think of those. Yesterday we looked at James chapter 4. I want to look at a very similar verse in, in 1 Peter. It's almost identical. There's a little bit of difference uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5. At the end of yesterday, we read verse 5. We actually read the first five verses of 1 Peter 5. And I'd like to pick it up in the middle of verse 5, where we read, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, and then, yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and hear this part, and be clothed with humility. Isn't that what Abraham was clothed with? Be clothed with humility. And then he goes on to say, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. That has to do with my attitude. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So when we think about these, these verses, I want to back up. He says, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Abraham was willing to humble himself and allow God to work things out. And then notice this. We often take verse 7 and we often... Take it out of context, and, it, and that's okay. But notice it in its context. In its context, it's talking about if you've got cares and you've got things with the difficulties around you, you can cast those cares upon the Lord, knowing that He cares for you. So you can take those and lay them at His feet. You don't have to carry that, that concern that's surrounding that conflict. In its context, he's talking about relationships with one another and being clothed in humility and how God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And if I'm clothed with humility, not that I'm occupied with the fact that, boy, don't I look good in my humility today? Then I'm not humble. Right? We said yesterday that humility is not thinking of yourself at all, but it's only being occupied with the glory of God. And so here he says, that as I'm occupied with the glory of God and the situation surrounding me and I find myself in the conflict, how wonderful that I can cast my care upon Him. Because here's the thing, if I'm not casting my care upon Him, the enemy's going to come in. And notice he says this, to be sober, that my attitude needs to be one of sobriety, my attitude needs to be one of vigilance, that I need to be on guard because I have an adversary, the devil. Now what's interesting about that verse, if you noticed it, the adversary, the devil. Both his names are right there. Adversary, that means Satan. Satan means adversary. So here he's Satan. He's our adversary. He's the one that opposes God. He's the one that stands against God. He's the one that's rebellious toward God. And he is against me. And he's against you. And I got to tell you something. On Thursday... Wednesday and Thursday of this week, I was sick. And I almost canceled. Thursday morning, I almost canceled this trip. I almost canceled out. Because I had a, such a tooth, I thought it was a toothache, and then it went into my ear, and it hurt so bad, and I just felt, oh, I can't do anything. I can't even talk. I said, I, I, I just, to drive 10 hours? To speak and then 10 hours back home? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going. And then I was laying before the Lord. And then this verse came to my mind. And I said, 
could be that the enemy doesn't want me to go. And I said, Lord, if you want me to go to Bethesda, then show me by taking away the pain. You can give it back to me if you want. I hope you don't. (laughs) But take it away. Because if the enemy is trying to keep me away from this message, that brothers and sisters, I think is so important for our day today, this manner of resolving conflict from a biblical point of view, our, dis- our assemblies are being destroyed left and right. And if we don't know how to handle conflict, we're going to just let the devil right in. So I said to the Lord, if you want me to go, if this is the adversary, show me. And you know, by that night, I was feeling okay. The next morning, I was feeling better. The next morning, I was feeling a little bit better. So off I went. Last night, pain started coming back. And I said, all right, Lord, what I said about giving it back, forget about that part. But here's the thing. Our enemy is very, very real. And he wants to trip up the work of God. We have an adversary. And he'll use whatever he can to trip up anybody and anything. And we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. And we need not to be a tool in his hand. So he says, because you have an adversary, the devil. Notice yesterday we said what that meant. The word devil means the accuser. And he loves to accuse the brethren. And he loves to get the brethren to accuse the brethren. And he loves for us to find the faults in everyone. But you know what the Spirit of God wants us to see in one another? Christ. The Spirit of God wants me to look at you and see Christ. The Spirit of God wants you to look at me and see Christ. The devil wants me to look at you and find all the faults about you. And the devil wants you to look at me and say, you know that, Tim, this, this, this. I could give you a lot of faults. But we're told to resist him, be steadfast in the faith. So the first thing that I see in James chapter 1, verse 19 is that he says we are beloved brethren. We're in the same family. The next thing that I see here, quickly moving on, he says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Swift to hear. Now I'm going to make a statement that's probably um, a very profound statement. Do you know that you have two ears and one mouth? Pretty profound, right? Why do you think you have two ears and one mouth? So that we talk less and we listen more. You have two ears. God says to us that we ought to be swift to hear. Swift to hear. I read this. It says that the average human, get this, the average human speaks about 150 to 200 words a minute. I know some people can beat that, but anyway, that's... But listen to this. But we can listen to about 800 words a minute. That's what they say. We speak about 150 to 200 words a minute. But we can actually hear and listen to about 800 words a minute. Well, Scripture already told us that because Scripture already said to be swift to hear. How do we hear? Very practical. Have you ever experienced this? I had a grandpa. My grandpa would take the newspaper and he would sit down in his chair with the newspaper and he'd be reading like this. And grandma would come by and grandma would talk to him and, and you'd hear this grunting behind the paper. You, what do you want for, eh? You know, that, he wasn't ever listening and she, she would say something and he would grunt behind the paper and never listen. We can listen like that to one another. We can, this is so important because listening also helps us to understand the other person. Listening to the person, have you ever been talking to somebody and you know they're not paying attention to you? You ever experienced that? 
where you're talking to them and, and they're looking around the room, see if there's anybody better to talk to. I hope you've experienced it because I don't want to be the only one. We can listen like that. I had a boss once that he was a district manager and he would come in. I was a manager of, of this store and he would come in and as he would come in, we noticed something about him. All the employees talked to me about him. They didn't like him because he would come in and he would say, how are you doing today? And he never listened for the response. You know what he would do? He would, he would say, how are you doing today? And he'd say, good, 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 glad to hear it. Keep it up. And on he would go. Right? So one day, everybody working there, they felt like he's not listening to anything we say. So that this is what we're going to do. And they got everybody to do it. Even me. We got everybody to do it. So he said, well, Dane, how are you today? Well, I got a flat tire on the way here and I had to walk the rest. Oh, good, 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 good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> how are you today, Wendy? Well, my husband and I are getting a divorce. Oh, good, good, good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. And he did that to everybody. He wasn't listening to anything anybody said. At the end of the day, I brought him into my office and we sat down. And I said, Rick, and I told him the little experiment. And he responded. I don't think he really changed much. But we can be like that. I want to suggest a couple of things for us. How we can listen. We can listen with observation. Point number one. We can listen to one another with observation. That means that we listen not only with our ears, but we listen with our eyes. We look at one another while we're being spoken to. Husbands, this will change your marriage if we do this. Wives, this will change your marriage. Brothers, in the meeting, this, this is extremely important. That if we look at one another and we listen to one another and we listen with observation, it makes a big difference, that eye contact. Secondly, to listen not only with observation but with concentration. To concentrate on what somebody's saying to us. When someone's speaking to us, we want to concentrate. We want to focus in on what they're saying, to concentrate. And then not only to observe and to concentrate, but then thirdly, to consider. Observation, concentration, and consideration. To consider what the person's saying. You know what happens so often, especially if I'm in a conflict with somebody and I'm trying to listen and all I'm doing is I'm thinking about what I'm going to say in defense of what was just said instead of listening for the whole thing. And then we say, well, you're not listening to me. Yeah, I heard what you said. Yeah, but you're not listening to me. You heard me, but you're not listening. Listening with consideration means that I'm going to respect you enough that I'm going to hear you out. And then the last one is observation, concentration, consideration. And then the last one, we sort of mentioned this yesterday, clarification. To listen and, and ask. Now, let me just ask you a question. This is, this is what I heard you say. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I heard you say. Is that really what you were saying? Is that what you meant? Clarification. And it makes a big difference. I, I, when I start doing that to my wife and saying, well, honey, I, I heard you say this. Is that what you meant? No. Okay, could you tell me what you meant? Because <laughs> I missed it. And I tell you, what a difference it makes to talk to one another in a brother's meeting. Brothers, to look at each other, to concentrate on what's being said, to consider what's being said, and then to ask for clarification. Notice he says this. Going back to James chapter 1, verse 19. We're brethren. We're in the same family. My beloved brethren. Let everyone be swift to hear. And then the next one, the third thing, is slow to speak. Now, slow to speak does not mean that I speak like this. 
That's not what it means. Slow to speak has the idea. Well, let's put it this way. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 17, 27 says, He who has knowledge spares his words. A man of understanding has a calm spirit. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23 says, reminds us, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Whoever guards his mouth and keeps his tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes 5, 3, a fool's voice is known by many words. A fool's voice is known by many words. So there's ample scripture to remind us that we need to be slow to speak. We need to tune in and we need to be swift to hear, but we also need to tone down and slow to speak. So we need to tune in, but we need to tone down. The fourth thing that James talks about is not only to be, as we said, we're brethren, we're in the same family. To let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. But then he says, slow to wrath. We talked a little bit about this wrath yesterday, to be angry and sin not. And I just want to reiterate what I said yesterday is that most of the time when we're angry, we have to confess, or at least I do, I have to confess that when I'm angry, most of the time it's not righteous anger. Most of the time it's my flesh being stirred up. And so the admonishment for us here in James, in a very practical sense, he says, be slow to wrath. Be slow to wrath. Ecclesiastes 7 says this, do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. He says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22, he says, the angry man stirs up strife. And a furious man abounds in transgression. In Proverbs 16, 32, he says, it encourages us there to remember that he who is slow to anger is better than mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Can I suggest this? We said that at the outset, we said that the idea of conflict is danger an opportunity, right? There's an opportunity, or it could be a danger, conflict. Think about this. Now, I realize that we're in multiculture here, but we are, I am speaking English, so I'm going to use this in, in English, because it only works in English. Do you know that there's only one letter in the English language between danger and anger? If you're angry... You're one letter away from danger. Think about that. So he says, be slow to wrath. The way to solve that is to be filled with the Spirit of God. To be in the Word of God. To be filled with the Spirit of God so that the Spirit of God will control the man of God so that the man of God can glorify God. And isn't that what we want in the long run? Don't we want out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? Don't we want what's in our heart and what comes out of our mouth to glorify God? That's what we said at the very beginning of, of conflict, of our thoughts together. So then we think about these things in this one verse that he's mentioned that we need to tune in. We need to be quick to listen. We need to tone down to be slow to speak. We need to lighten up and be slow to wrath. But there's one more thing, if I can just point us to us to, to this. It's in chapter 5 of James. We need to look up. In chapter 5 of James, if you just turn there, and we'll finish with this. In chapter 5 of James... Starting at verse 13 and going to the end of the chapter, James mentions about seven times uh, 
in those closing verses the need of prayer. And I would suggest to us that um, before we express our opinion in a conflict, before we pick up the phone and call Brother A to see how he feels about this conflict that we, we think we're in, before we get sister so-and-so on our side, before we do anything else, before we talk to somebody else about the conflict, let's talk to the Lord about the problem. You know, judging from chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, judging from chapter 4, the first 11 verses, and judging now from chapter 5 of James, the verses that we're going to look at, there must have been conflict that James was addressing. And he gives us those three portions of Scripture that I think are very valuable for us. But notice this in verse 16, James chapter 5, verse 16. He says, confess your trespass one to another. He starts there, he says, confess your trespass to one another. Now, sometimes we take this out of the blue and we think every time we sin, we have to run and tell somebody. But I, I really think this trespass means I've stepped over the line. And in my relationship with you, I've stepped over the line and I need to come and tell you, look, I've stepped over the line here and, and I need to get this right with you. So he says, confess your trespasses one to another. You know, husbands would take this humble step and say, you know what, sweetheart, I've stepped over the line here. I just need to tell you I'm sorry. The, the way I spoke to you just now, it was too sharp. I didn't need to do that. I need to ask you to forgive me. I need to confess my trespass to you. I've stepped over the line. What a difference it would make in a marriage. What a difference that attitude would make in an assembly, in a local assembly. What an attitude, what a difference that attitude would make in the workplace or even with my children. I, as a father, have had to come to my children and I have had to say, Daddy was wrong. I've had to tell my children I was wrong. The way I behaved. What I said was absolutely right. But the way I said it wasn't right. Could you forgive me? One of, one of the best moments of my life, I had to approach one of my boys and I had to apologize. And when I did, tears went down his face. And, and he hugged me up. And then he says, what was the problem all about? I forgot. <laughs> How wonderful. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that in any way to pat myself on the back. God forbid the thought. But brethren, this is what I've been learning along the way. And I share it with us. He says, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another. Don't talk about each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. So he's saying here, look, there's a problem and he's, he's attaching this that, that this problem is, is caused, the health issue that's there could be caused because of the problem amongst the people of God. So he says, pray for one another. He says, confess your trespasses. Pray for one another that you may be healed. But can we take it away from the physical just for a moment and say that sometimes there's spiritual sickness in an assembly. And until we confess our trespasses one to another, and until we start praying for each other instead of talking about each other, that we're not going to be healed. We're not going to heal those, those difficulties, those conflicts. But if I could use that as an application for us, that if we confess our trespasses one to another and we pray for one another, that you may be healed. So what a tremendous thing that he says here for us to think about in this manner. And he goes on to talk about prayer and he uses Elijah as a man of prayer and whatnot. But James says we need to be slow slow he says well, first of all he says we're in the same family and then he says that because we're in the same family we need to be s s swift to hear 
slow to speak, slow to anger. And then he reminds us that we need to be looking up, we need to be confessing our, our faults, we need to be praying for one another that you may be healed. And I tell you, there is a sickness. In Hebrews chapter 12, we'll close with this. Whenever a preacher says that, it means about 10 more minutes, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we'll close with this. In Hebrews chapter 12, remember we talked a lot yesterday about pursuing peace. Look at verse 14. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people, even those people that are difficult to get along with. Pursue peace and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You want to see the Lord work? You want to see the power of God in display? Pursue peace. Pursue peace and pursue God's holiness. Remember, we said righteousness. Yesterday, we said righteousness, purity, and peace go together. Here it is again, showing, it, showing up again together. Without which no one will see the Lord. And then he says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. That doesn't mean that we'll be lost. But what that's talking about is that I won't be able to display the grace of God in my life. I'm going to fall short of it. It's not going to be manifesting itself in my day-to-day -day living. And he says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this, many become defiled. About 15 years ago, amongst our assemblies, we had a division because of association with evil defiled. We believe in that 100%. We believe that association with evil defiles. But beloved, there's another type of defilement that we don't talk about very often. And that's what's given to us right here. A root of bitterness by which many are defiled. And that's the sickness that I'd like to tie in back to James. It could be one of those types of sicknesses that if there's unforgiveness and, and that's allowed to grow and that's allowed that little seed of unforgiveness that becomes a little seed of animosity and then that animosity becomes a little bitterness and then that bitterness grows down and it grabs its ugly roots around to the heart of the believer and then that bitterness just grows and then every time I think of that brother, every time I think of that sister, there's just bitterness and, and resentment toward them. And then pretty soon it's not going to take long before everybody in the fellowship Everybody in that local assembly is defiled because of my bitterness in my heart. Because I didn't have a forgiving spirit. Because I didn't go and confess my trespasses. Because I didn't go and say, I've overstepped the line. It don't matter what you've done to me. I have overstepped the line. It's not a matter of saying, you know what, I've overstepped the line, but you really shouldn't have done what you did. That's not confession. Confession is, look, I'm not the man I ought to be, and I'm sorry. Could you forgive me? Recently, I asked a brother to forgive me about something. He said, okay. I said, no, do, do you forgive me? Yeah, I forgive you. He said, yeah. And I said, no, but do you forgive me? Yeah. I said, no, do you forgive me? He wasn't getting what I was... I said, I need to hear you say, I forgive you. So that I know you forgive me. He said, ah, I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. And I said, well, I'm not leaving until you forgive me. I said, I'm here. And I'll call my wife and tell her I'm staying tonight because I'm here. He said, if that's the case, then I forgive you. And he laughed. You know what, brothers and sisters, this is, this is what we need. This is what we need. Biblical conflict, bi biblical resolution to conflict from the Bible. It has to do with my heart. That's where it begins. 
So may the Lord just, you know, here's the standard. There, you know it's for real. My Bible's up there. Here's the standard. Forgive even as God has forgiven you. That's the standard. It's a high standard, but that's the standard. May the Lord help us in looking at conflict, realizing that it's not just about what that brother did, that sister did, that husband of mine, that wife of mine. It's about me. What's my response? May the Lord help us for his name's sake. Perhaps a brother could close in prayer.